Good afternoon. Um, got Will Will here with Rabbit and uh, Will. If you can kind of give us a little bit of background about yourself, where you've been, what you've seen, what you conquered. You know, yeah. All, all the ups uh, good and afternoon. Downs. Good afternoon, KP. Really excited to chat with you today. You know, a little bit about me. You know, I was born in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, grew up in the Denver area. I think, you know, one of the things that really kind of defines me as an entrepreneur is that my, my parents divorced when I was four years old. And, you know, neither of them really were very excited about being the one responsible for taking care of me through uh, middle school and high school. And so from a very young age, I learned like if I wanted to get something, I had to go and, uh, and raise the money to do it. And so, you know, in uh, middle school, I raised a $800 to go on a trip to New York. In high school, I started a lawn mowing business to pay for books and stuff before I started working at the Marriott. And then college, I started a company um, to help uh, pay for college. So from a very young age, you know, really kind of took a very entrepreneurial uh, bent towards all the things that I did um, as really kind of saw it as a no other option to achieve the goals that I wanted to accomplish. Got it. And where'd you go to college? Went to college at the University of Virginia uh, in Charlottesville, not too far north from you all down there in Atlanta. Um, lovely school, highly recommend. I studied architecture and structural engineering. Um, and so ended up with minors in structural engineering and architectural history, in addition to my Bachelor of Science in Architecture. Um, really, you know, what I found in college is that they didn't charge you by credit. It was a flat rate um, for as many credits as you could take, which was awesome because anybody who wants to get as much as they can, they loaded up as many credits as possible. And so I ended up, you know, 18, 19, 19 credit you know, semesters all the way through until finally in my fourth year, I decided it was, it was a little bit too much work and I should actually enjoy college for a little bit. Nice. And wh where'd you work after college? What'd you get to? Yeah. So my first job right after college was as a um, owner's rep real estate developer in Washington, DC. We were doing a 528 unit condo conversion project. So this is back in 06 when condo conversions were super popular, um, actually ended up being one of the best performing assets in uh, the company's portfolio at the time. Um, but when I arrived on the site, I think it was 12 months behind schedule on an 18 month project. Um, so needless to say, there was a number of issues that needed to be worked out, um, but it was a great uh, dive in the deep end into real estate development right after college. Great. And what'd you do after that? Did you stick in that world or did you make moves after that? Yeah. So in the great financial crisis, I was laid off. Um, so the company that I worked for went from 160 people down to 40 over kind of a 12 month span. And I was in one of the first, first rounds of cuts. And right after that, bounced around to a couple firms until I ended up at a construction consulting firm. And so we did a lot of government work, working for different public entities. So um, restorations of old buildings, renovations of old buildings, uh, actually did a prison elevator at one point, a golf course, a uh, preschool. Um, so really after that, um, anybody who had uh, the ability to do some construction work during that time, I was uh, willing to go and help and work with them. Nice. And so what, what kind of problems did you see? I mean, I, I think I started my life as a, as a field engineer and you see yeah. more problems and solutions when you're out there in the real world. So what did you start to see out there? Yeah, so on that fun 528 unit condo conversion project, we were tracking costs at the unit level, which, um, you know, in retrospect, I'm not even sure why, but we had this massive Excel spreadsheet and I, I, I'm 100% sure that every single month I found a math error in the spreadsheet. So every month I would be trying to total stuff and I would then have to find out where the math was wrong because without a doubt, there was some error in the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and this is back in the days where kind of the other 
at least most known software was a company called Prologue. And it was like a 3000 ton brick for um, all the things that you could potentially ever want to track on a construction project. And so you had this like two ends of the spectrum, Excel that was infinitely flexible and could be really simple or this Prologue that was like just a massive dare I say bloated software for trying to do everything on a construction project. And there really just didn't seem to be anything that was uh, built uh, for the 21st century. Yeah. And, and what did that lead up to? So did you, so when did you, did you leave there? Did you see these problems and go start something or did we just hang out and like complain about it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, luckily through the crisis, I ended up back at a real estate development firm, um, you know, 2011, 2010. And at that point, I had started to kind of buy houses and flip houses on the side. And, you know, what I found is, you know, the market was so hot, kind of like it is today, frankly, that like a house would have 26 offers within 24 hours true story wow. and you know at that point if you're winning that house you you made a mistake but um the reality was like you couldn't actually go and look at houses fast enough and run the numbers efficiently and so you needed to come up with a more efficient way to kind of assess the potential costs on doing a project and so this idea of having an efficient kind of calculator for tracking um, construction projects, specifically the costs, um, became really interesting to me. And I had built out something that, you know, allowed me to quickly help estimate the cost to flip a, a property. And at that point decided, you know, if there was going to be a technology revolution in the construction and uh, engineering sector that I wanted to be a part of it. And Very cool. so decided to leave, go to business school, thinking that um, you needed to know about business to be a good entrepreneur. Um, jury's still out on that one. Uh, but the reality is uh, I came to UT Austin uh, in Texas and uh, started tracking uh, you know, different ideas um, right at the beginning of business school. Um, and it's, it's quite fortuitous that potentially the number one entrepreneurship market and the number one real estate market are both in Texas eight years later. So yeah. I seem to have, I think I've made the right decision on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while, the market moves towards you. You don't have to chase it. Right. 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 Every once nice, in a while. The four of the top 10 real estate markets in the country are all in Texas yeah. and I'm in the center of Texas. Yeah. So what, what prompted you know like building a startup it's it's rarely a straight line um so what were kind of some of the drivers that went into thinking of you know early ideas about what became rabbit and kind of the the iteration of problem identification and studying those problems yeah so it really actually started out in the residential homeowner market so when we started when I started the company in college in 2013, it was more focused on helping a homeowner like yourself, who's wanting to renovate their kitchen, get an estimate for that cost. And it's actually interesting. I was talking to a banker yesterday and she's um, trying to do some renovation to her kitchen right now. And basically she had like a threshold of, if it's above this, I need to work for another year. If it's below this, I get to retire. And it's, you know, it was, very palpable the importance of understanding how much a project could cost but the only way for her to do that even today is to kind of go and have a contractor come out to her house and like frankly typically three contractors because you need like a high bid and a low bid and then a medium bid to really know what the range is and so the initial idea was hey could we kind of do a true car for home renovation and give people some bookends of what this project would cost and then they could and, you know, make the decision of whether or not it was worth engaging a contractor and ideally save time for both the homeowner and the contractor. Yeah. And that seems like pretty far away from where you are now. Yes. What we found <laughs> is that space, um, the cost of customer acquisition to the lifetime value was pretty awful and getting paid was absolutely terrible. Like people did not pay their bills. It was really awful. Um, and so throughout the process, we really kind of you know, talk to a number of homeowners and it's really understanding the costs and how much things are costing and um, tracking those costs became the 
main kind of concern. And so hearkening back to my days of that Excel spreadsheet with math errors in it every single time, you know, I was wondering if there was potentially a better way and met a gentleman in Denver, Colorado that kind of said, hey, I just built a house and I don't know how much I spent on the house and I'm not sure the bank knows how much I spent on the house. And I was like, this moment, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like the banks are spending millions of dollars on houses and they don't even know how much they're spending. And the reality was, as we started talking to banks and homeowners, they're all using Excel to track billions and billions, trillions of dollars of construction each year. And so um, that was the somewhat circuitous route to where we're at today. I called it a pivot. Some people called it a new company, but we won't uh, mince words on that. <laughs> and so what, what's the problem you're solving now? Yeah, so the main problem that we're solving is that there's a lack of kind of centralization of information for people on a construction project to make informed decisions. And so primarily for real estate developers and real estate uh, construction lenders that are, you know, processing the monthly draws and, you know, con collaborating around um, getting everybody paid on the project. One, it takes too long. Um, and two, you know, really understanding what's going on is, is trapped in disparate Excel spreadsheets and PDFs and emails, and really just having a central location for everybody to be on the same page is a massive value. And then you can layer on automation and collaboration and then some, you know, AI and machine learning on top of it that provides excised value for folks but honestly just getting everything in one place is a huge huge start for a lot of people yeah that's interesting but so you when you look at it you know i was always at the bottom of the food chain as a civil engineer i had to wait you know i was the last guy getting paid and right you know it was 100 days to get paid and it wasn't it was, we always said it was never a question of if we would get paid it was always just a question of when we would get paid yeah. Um, and in the meantime, you've run, you know, six payroll cycles <laughs> in the meantime. And so we do our payments report every year. It's actually going to come out next week. So Megan would love your help promoting that, <laughs> um, you know, and that quantified the cost of uh, slow payments last year at $100 billion in the U.S. alone. Like you're floating that payroll while you're waiting to get paid that six payroll cycles you know, that working capital for small firms is um, mm -hmm. difficult and costly. Some people are putting that on credit cards. Some people are using their personal savings. Uh, and so the payment cycle is extremely difficult. And the reality is the banks are the ones that are dispersing the vast majority of those payments. Mm -hmm. And until we help the banks better collaborate with the developers and better collaborate with the general contractors, it's going to remain a, a slow process because yeah. push payments only helps if the person who's paying you is the one that has the money. And the reality is it's going through four or five levels before it gets to you as the civil engineer. Yeah. And it's interesting right now, you know, we talk about labor shortage, all that, right? And I was talking to a developer yesterday and he said the best way to keep the best contractors working for you, it's pretty simple. Pay them on time. It's, it's not even like price. I mean, everybody tries to negotiate a good price, but the amount of cash the industry has to float waiting on someone else, just pay them on time and you will attract the best teams mm -hmm. at the best contractors. And now where every contractor has their pick of who they want to work for, it seems like you almost have to do this, right? There's no... Yeah, and if you think about it, right, there's so many of these new companies that are doing even like same day payroll, right? Like I work today, I get paid tonight. I work today, tomorrow, I get paid tomorrow night. And if you think about it right now, construction's at like a seven week lag on payroll, not much, like much less the same day payroll. And so the truth is that is a benefit to no one, yeah. right? Like the bank doesn't benefit holding onto the money longer. The developer doesn't benefit from waiting to pay the contractors. As you just said, they want to pay these people as quickly as possible. The fact is, it's just such a difficult bureaucratic process in the current infrastructure. But we've confirmed with financial institutions that if you are able to build a better mousetrap here, they will fund weekly on mm -hmm. projects. 
which would massively change the cost to the civil engineer and the interest return for the bank. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that I, I saw the most, for me, the most disheartening thing in our industry is the cost of capital goes up as you go down the food chain. So now all of a sudden you have this poor guy who maybe doesn't even have a bank account standing there waiting for his contractor to write him a check mm-hmm. and then walking across the street to a check cashing center, getting like 30% lopped off. And 100% of that pay- paycheck is going to groceries, right? It's not like, oh, I got to make a car payment. It's, it's, it's not even like that, you know, middle, it's not a middle-class problem, right? Yeah. And it's one of the most disheartening. And it's all because like, the developer, you know, everybody drags their feet, but you know, the cost of capital goes way up as you go down that 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 um, payment cycle, and, and it's very disheartening. Like to me, like that's those are the people that really really suffer when payments don't get made. Well, and I think you noted on an important part is like you are always going to get paid. Like the fact is, like you're going to get paid. The question is when, and the reasons that gets load is just bad infrastructure and so rabbit is out to build better infrastructure yeah. is the shortest way i can explain yeah. it that's great well it's great talking to you will is there anything that i should have asked you that i didn't ask you oh you know i um i don't think so i mean the um the industry is in such a great place right now you've seen so much excitement so many great firms i mean it's uh, the funny story I'll share and then we can go. I, um, I, you know, I went to business school in 2013 and, you know, I was talking to, I, I was in a program called Venture Fellows, which, uh, you know, helps, you know, business students learn about venture capital. And my professor in the course, um, you know, I was telling about my idea, blah, blah, blah. And like seven years later, in, I think it's 2000, whatever, 19, he emails me and he says, well, there was a billion dollars invested in construction technology last year. Who would have known? And it's like, I told you this seven years ago that this was coming. Um, And so it's been such a fun time to watch, you know, this industry grow and great folks like yourself um, continuing to lead the charge forward. So thank you so much. Appreciate the support and uh, getting the good word out on all the great things that can happen in the construction industry. All right, great. All right, thanks, Will.